Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on how climate assemblies can support greening communities. My name is Edith Hammer. I'm a program specialist at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, and uh, today I'm the moderator of this session. And before diving into the topic of today's webinar, I will provide you with a quick overview of what to expect today and in the following months of, uh, of this webinar series. So today's event is the second one of our webinar series on building green, inclusive and climate resilient urban communities, the Learning Cities approach. The series includes nine monthly webinars on the road to the sixth International Conference of Learning Cities, which will be held in the city of Jubail in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from the 3rd to the 5th of December this year. And the theme of the conference is Learning Cities at the Forefront of Climate Action, so very closely related to the series. In line with the ICL topic, uh, ICLC topic, we will cover a broad themes, uh, uh, thematic scope from green skills to digital learning for climate action to countering climate disinformation and rethinking our relationship with nature. And I would like to invite you to explore all those topics on our UL website. The overarching objective of our webinar series is to bring Learning City representatives and other stakeholders working on lifelong learning and climate action together to learn from each other's experience and to support sustainable action. So today uh, we can look forward to a very interesting uh, set of contributions. Uh, first, we will hear from Ms. Isabel Kemp, who is the director of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, and she will give us a brief introduction to the webinar. Then we will have three presentations, starting with an international perspective on climate assemblies uh, provided by an expert from the Knowledge Network of, on Climate Assemblies. And this will be followed by inputs from two learning cities, namely the city of Bonn in Germany, and uh, with a recorded presentation today and uh, an experience from the city of Querétaro in Mexico. Following the presentations, we will proceed to a discussion with questions from the audience. Uh, and before uh, we begin, I would like to provide you some technical details. First of all, this webinar event is being recorded and will be subsequently shared on the URL Learning Hub, also on our website. Uh, if you have any comments uh, that you would like to share during the webinar, kindly use the chat box that is available in the menu bar. And for any questions you may have for the panelists, uh, we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box uh, and we will do our best to respond to as many of your questions as possible. Interpretation will be available throughout the webinar in Arabic, French, Korean and Chinese, and hopefully also in Spanish. We are still waiting for the Spanish interpreter today, so I hope it will be available very soon. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click on the interpretation button, which looks like a globe, and then choose the language that you would like to hear. And um, it would be good for you to familiarize yourself with the language button as uh, the presentation from Carretero today will be in Spanish and uh, you will have to switch the channel uh, during this presentation. Please let me take the opportunity also to express our appreciation for supporting language interpretation for Arabic interpretation is provided by the Regional Center of Quality and Excellence in Education under the auspices of UNESCO located in Jubail, Saudi Arabia. Korean interpretation is kindly provided by the Learning City of Goyang in the Republic of Korea. And Chinese interpretation is provided by our partner, the Shanghai Municipal Institute for Lifelong Learning, SMILE. So thanks a lot to our partners for making this possible. Now, without further delay, uh, let us hear from Ms. Isabel Kemp, the UL Director, to start today's webinar. Please, Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Edith, and good morning, afternoon, and also good evening to, to all of you. A really warm welcome to today's webinar, which is on climate assemblies. Uh, they are really a bottom-up form of citizen assemblies and uh, democratic participation. Um, allowing local populations to um, gather recommendations and find solutions to combat the climate crisis and also to make cities climate neutral. Climate assemblies usually bring together a diverse group of citizens, which are often chosen by democratic lottery. 
Some of them exist at the national level, but we can also find very interesting examples of such participatory and engaging approaches in cities. And that's what we would like to explore today. Um, one of the presentations today will be from the city of uh, Bonn, which organized a large scale participatory process, which uh, including civil society, the city administration, other local associations and randomly selected citizens to advance on climate action and enable long-term transformation. By coincidence, I was one of the citizens selected by the lottery. So this was a really important learning experience from myself. Um, and what did I really learn in this? I think, first of all, I learned that um, perception of greening a city can be very different depending on what you're used to. I had just arrived from Nairobi, um, and of course, for me, I saw that one had already a lot of public space and cycleways, but a lot of the citizens in Bonn saw it very differently. For them, there was too much public space in town uh, that had been used as parking spaces, which is very expensive to maintain, and it also, of course, took away public space for playgrounds and, <coughs> and other meeting areas. I also learned the, the importance of expert inputs. Um, for example, one of the traffic experts showed us that most of the poor people use their cars for rides of less than three kilometers, and not as I had thought for longer rides from coming out outside town. I also understood that if you want Isabel, excuse me, you're muted. Sorry, and I also learned from this experience um, about the importance of linking citizens' initiatives with the political momentum. And uh, Dr. Marshovsky from Bonn will explain in her contribution today how this was organized and done in the citizen assembly that took place in, in Bonn. So I really look forward to learn from this and other initiatives around the world and uh, wish you a really interesting webinar. Um, the floor is now back to Edith. Many, many thanks. Thank you, Isabel, for this uh, warm welcome and introduction um, to, the, uh, to the webinar and uh, to sharing your experience on being a participant in the Climate Assembly. And uh, I would now like to pass on the floor to our first um, presenter today. Uh, Mr. Björn Bettstedt from the Knowledge Network of Climate Assemblies, NYOKA, and he will provide us with an introduction to climate assemblies. So what are they? How do they work? And uh, what is their particular value? So Björn, floor is yours. You have eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just getting the presentation ready here. I'll try on full screen and see how that works. Yes, hello everyone, and thank you for the invitation. My name is Bjorn Bilster. I'm the international director at uh, Democracy X, uh, and also a member of the Knowledge Committee of uh, the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what is a climate assembly? What's the rationale behind them? And what are our experiences with how they work? I can see a hand. Maybe there's a translation issue. No? Oh, uh, it disappeared. I think you can continue. Okay. So climate assemblies are one particular part, uh, type of uh, a mini public. Uh, so mini publics are different kinds of methods for, uh, in, for engaging ordinary citizens in uh, policy uh, making. And climate assemblies or climate citizen assemblies is a particular method uh, uh, that was developed uh, uh, for this purpose. Um, how do they work? What are the steps? 
they usually start with politicians or policymakers coming up with a type of question, a remit, or challenge that they would like uh, citizens to discuss and give recommendations on. Then citizens are selected, uh, and here representativity is important in terms of demographic uh, criteria. Um, typically 100 for national assemblies, which NACA has had its main focus on, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, less for local and subnational climate assemblies. They're characterized by giving information to citizens either during uh, the actual assembly or, or and sometimes also before. They typically last three weekends, uh, sometimes even more. Uh, the French National Assembly lasted for seven uh, uh, weekends uh, at least. Um, it's a complex process where citizens come together in plenaries and group works, the knowledge panels, uh, panel presentations, Q&A sessions, and so on. And what comes out in the end is a list of recommendations, mostly to politicians. And the hope uh, is that they will result in both public and political debate and action. Uh, these are just some examples of some of the national assemblies uh, NACA has looked into. And here's a bigger list, a map of the uh, of the climate assemblies that we are aware of across Europe. Uh, many of those are also uh, local and uh, uh, municipal climate assemblies. So why, why would anyone want to do a climate assembly? Um, one reason is that uh, the expectation is that you get more robust and ambitious climate policy. Uh, you sort of alleviate climate uh, inequalities and the power of vested interests. Uh, climate assemblies can break political deadlocks. It can reduce polarization because it offers a space where in-depth deliberation between uh, different interests are, are, is taking place. It increases legitimacy and public acceptance of political choices, uh, and then it develops a more climate aware and confident uh, citizenry. Those are the promises of uh, the climate assemblies. And we've been looking at those in, um, in the knowledge network on, on climate assemblies, which is a European based network funded by the European Climate Foundation, where we look at the different practices uh, we uh, disseminate good practices. We give advice to governments that want to initiate climate assemblies on what are the learnings uh, from other climate assemblies and how do you do this well. Um, here comes uh, a few emerging trends, challenges, and opportunities recently identified in a NACA report. Um, so what do we know? Um, we know that the participants themselves uh, start in these processes thinking that they have little uh, knowledge and uh, ability to, to contribute to policy discussions. They come out in the other end feeling more confident and, and with a feeling that they do have sufficient understanding to give recommendations to politicians. Um, and again, the promise here is that this results in more progressive solutions than, co than current policies. Um, but we've also been looking at the impact. So what is the actual impact of these processes? It has been limited, but it hasn't at all been insignificant. Um, and when talking about impact, it's really important to... Um, to have a very fine grained matrix because these processes can have impact on policy, which is the usual impact you might think of. It can also have impact on institutions, public discourse and participants. 
these are some of the examples of the different types of impact that different national climate assemblies have had. And I'll not, not go through this because the, I don't think there's enough time for this, uh, but it just illustrates that the impacts, the type of in, impact has not been the same uh, uh, in different countries. Um, to summarize what we have learned from those uh, processes is that um, when uh, climate assemblies fail to deliver on their promise or fail to deliver sufficiently uh, to their promise, uh, it, it has to do with four main issues. One is that the remit, meaning the task and the question you give to the citizens doesn't really, uh, isn't really good enough. And I'll get back to that. Then there's uh, the issue of the robustness and transparency of uh, the process. If, if it is not sufficiently transparently done, and if it is not well enough done, which is sort of obvious, uh, they don't work so well. Uh, another factor is skepticism of climate uh, actors, a reluctance to engage among policymakers, stakeholder organizations, because this is a strange thing. And why should they concern themselves with this? Uh, that might be the attitude some of these uh, processes meet. And uh, finally, uh, it's uh, due to the integration or the limited integration in the political system. And this is uh, probably one of the most important issues that we're looking at in NOCA, because we know pretty well how to run an assembly. We have very good guidebooks for it and very good guidelines. We have talented organizations who can do this competently. But what lacks is sufficient uh, attention to what goes on before the assembly and what goes on after. Now, for example, returning to the remit, what is the right question to ask from citizens uh, at a certain stage uh, of policy developments? How does it fit into the policy cycle? Uh, will anyone even listen to this when uh, when uh, the citizens uh, give their recommendations? The other part and, and very important part also is what happens after uh, the assembly, which sh should be negotiated before. Namely, how will it land in a policy system? How do politicians take them into consideration what uh, arrangements have been made from this uh, for this in advance, uh, and how does uh, administrators, public officials, what can they do to make those recommendations matter uh, in policy making that takes place after the assembly? I mean, this is what is usually one of the tricky, most tricky points of uh, climate assemblies. So this is also part of the key takeaways. Um, it is very important to spend time, energy, and resources to get the remit, get the question right. What question are you going to ask to the citizen assembly to develop robust, robust governance and recruitment? These are more technical issues. To engage key stakeholders, both to have different points of views represented in the process itself, but also to generate ownership and ac acceptance by a wide variety of the societal actors and to prepare the administration, politicians and stakeholders to receive those recommendations. Um, and that's it uh, from me. Um, here's a link uh, to the website where you can join up as, uh, as a member and they are learning calls, regular learning calls. But at the website, there's a whole range of different guidance documents on how to make citizens, uh, climate assemblies, how it has been done in other countries, uh, and looking, diving into technical issues like recruitment and landing in a policy system, how to curate knowledge, uh, issues like that. So there are both some quick reads, uh, on a few of a few pages and longer guidance uh, document. 
and you can always get in touch with us to have more tailored uh, information and uh, guidance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Björn, for sharing such clear and informative presentation, which I think provides us with an excellent foundation for the practical examples that we'll go start to hear now. And um, to start with, we will have a presentation by Ms. Gesa Moszkowski, who is the initiator and project lead of Bonn for Future, the Bonn for Future process. And um, she will provide us with a detailed account of uh, developing and organizing such participatory process in the city of Bonn. Um, this will be a recorded presentation as she was not available to be with us today, but I think it provides a very good practical example following on what we have learned now um, uh, about the development and implementation of climate assemblies. So we will start the video now. Now I would like to share a little bit of practice, how to engage lots of different stakeholders and how to create this movement and yeah, this momentum for change. Um, the title of my presentation is um, Born for Future, Be for the Climate. It only works together and how to start the great co-creation. Next slide, please. So I will talk why Born for Future, how Born for Future, learnings and conclusions. Next slide, please. Bonn im Wandel is kind of the transition town initiative of Bonn. It's a part of a great, of a huge network, uh, international network of uh, communities who engage for change uh, in, in the entire world. Our values are people care, earth care, and fair share. And if you already noticed, uh, there's a big problem with these values bringing into life. So we started in 11 years ago to bring the positive vision of a sustainable bond here to life. We founded the first community agriculture, the first community-based cargo bikes, the first repair cafes, and so on. So like sustainability initiatives do. And also we started to connect civil society, societal actors with events, workshops, trainings, and our platform, our sustainability platform, Born for Future. And we cooperate locally with the administration here and also research institutes nationally, and we are a member of the International Transition Network. So that's us. Next slide, please. Um, the first thing we did when we heard about this wonderful decision the majority of the Bonn Council took to become climate neutral 2035. Thank you for this. We made a graph. So this is the challenge. You can see here the um, greenhouse gas emissions of Bonn from 1990 to kind of 2335. Uh, and we are here where the red arrow is. And now we have to do the turn down. That's a challenge. So we have to become seven times faster than before. Okay, next slide. And the question also is why we need to collaborate. And here you can see the greenhouse gas reduction pathways. On the left hand side, you see what the city can do. There's all already a little package which was uh, which is in in it's in stake. There is in the middle when the city changes the energy supply and the traffic and the green line on the right hand side the broad river kind of is this uh, the reduction um, the greenhouse gas reduction pathway for the entire urban society so everybody the enterprises the organization and so on so it's only possible if we collaborate next slide so what did we do we were very very grateful for this strong political decisions and we started in march 2020 um, a citizen petition for a participation process on for future and you can see some of the uh, organizations who uh, supported this meanwhile this meanwhile we have more than 80 organizations in bonn supporting this process um, mainly with uh, by practical support in june 2020 we designed uh, and born for future, the entire bond for future process with support of other experts and the city administration. This is already very um, uh, not usual that uh, civil society and administration works together. 
And in September 2020, the City Council decided by a large majority again to support this Bond for Future process and to cooperate. So we were cooperation partners. Next slide. What did we do? So uh, we started as we have to start when we want to change with a vision. We did the Climate Forum 1 uh, at the end of um, 21 and worked with several, about 150 people on future images of a climate neutral and livable city of Bonn. So these are the images which guided the process and it was very interesting. It was very open and we noticed that about nine fields of action came up. Then in Climate Forum 2 and 3, we asked for the idea, how can we achieve a climate neutral living and a climate neutral mobility? We did not ask if we want to achieve, and we did not ask if you have any idea how to do this. We, I tell it later, we ask how can we achieve this? That's a difference. And uh, last September, we uh, did the climate citizen climate action plan in seven fields of action, uh, like housing, nature-based solutions, uh, mobility, and so on. And all these plans uh, went up to the administration. You see the, <laughs> um, the administration nearly working. And um, we put together, they put together, we also, we both put together the climate plan from the expert consortium and the visions and recommendations from the civil society. And this went into the uh, city council and they decided really to bring both together and to check every recommendation if it's possible to implement it. So that was the uh, process. Um, who was involved? Over seven, the 200 randomly drawn citizens like mm -hmm. Isabel. <laughs> Societal actors, uh, experts from administration, uh, I am very grateful for this because if you involve experts from administ city administration, the process becomes much better. They have lots of knowledge. Our team, of course, we have we built a governance team between Bonn and Wandel and the city, city administration meeting every two weeks to a fix. Um, we have speakers, facilitators, scientists, of course, and Born for Future Advisory Board and the support organizations and many, many helpers. Okay, to ignore this. Um, next slide, please. So the most important result in one sentence. <laughs> if, so it's an if uh, function, yeah? If, <laughs> if you explain in a friendly and clear way the challenges of the climate crisis, and point out which goals we have to achieve. This must be very, very clear, according to the current state of science. And if you then create an appreciative atmosphere for the co-creation of, of solutions, I can tell you people are happy to work on this. Most citizens are ready to be involved and want things to move faster. This was a very interesting um, learning. Next slide, please. And I would like to demonstrate what does it mean, explain very understandable what we have to learn and to do. So these are two of our experts um, here. One, the, the left one is here from the um, Bonn Energy Agency. And they made very, very clear, they tied it up with illusions that hydrogen is no solution. Hydrogen will be bought away from the industry and the heavy load traffic. So no chance to use it for heating. And that applies also to wood in the future. So insulation is the only possibility to save us from the energy poverty here in Germany. So this is, I think, when we start to explain what we have to do, we have to be very explicit. And uh, the other expert said um, we need to use 40% less heat. Only then will renewables be enough for everyone. So it's also a question of social social justice uh, to reduce your heat demand. So next slide, please. What does it mean? We started to draw the problem and the solution. So you can see on the left hand side uh, different um, possibilities to um, 
get renewable um, uh, heat in your house. So, for example, with wood pellets or heat pumps or heating grids. But on the left hand side, you see a house which is not insulated and how much resources it needs. And on the right hand side, you can see the difference when the house is insulated or even when there are more people in the house. So this reduces your energy uh, demand as well per person. So this is a very brief example. What does it mean really to explain what's necessary, what's the goal and what's what we have to do on a very practical manner? And I, I feel there's lacking a lot of information in this space. People were happy to hear this and really to work with it. Next slide, please. So uh, I come to the um, results and recommendation of the people and um, we did a um, um, content analysis of all recommendations and found out there are five game changers. One game changer one is surprise communication. And um, if we talk about communication, people really said most people have no idea what climate crisis or even climate neutrality means for their everyday life. And they recommended really learning through experience what does the crisis or climate neutral neutrality mean for me in my neighborhood in my institution in my enterprise that's not clear still they recommended first it was very very uh, there was a lot of pressure there change mindset first um, start a participation campaign in every neighborhood organization and enterprise about how can we create a better quality of life with less consumption so this would be the, the base of every everything else. Uh, they want more transparency. They want a climate plan for everybody. So who has to do what to make it happen? So it has to, there has to be more transparency. They need positive target images, not just uh, this road will be closed for cars. No, uh, they want to see how, how the road will be after closing and how the future the desired future looks like so this is needed really to motivate people and we need good role models best of one so this is game changer one game changer two um people feel overwhelmed like everybody else of us i think it's it's really challenging this transformation and nobody really has scheduled it and put budget there and time in there so they pledged for support um and one um recommendation which arises arise in every climate forum was we need transformation centers in every district in every neighborhood we need transformation managers, they called it, I would say transition trainers or facilitators to bring the people together, future conferences, they want one for future in every neighborhood and everybody being involved. So social justice, we did not point out on just social justice in our uh, talks, but people by their own demanded social, social justice, this was a surprise. Thank you. And uh, I'm nearly the last slide, I think, for last slide, next please. So what can we do at the very bottom up um, movement? So we, I think transformation is a societal learning process. And I'm sure if we don't invest in this process, we will end up in the scenario too little too late. It's really about people. It's not about climate. It's also about climate, but people first. And we have to learn collaboration and action. And that's why I mean Germany as well is a developing country. We need more empathy, more collaboration, more solidarity. And this do we have to learn. And um, change, sorry, this is I'm at the second point. Change is best achieved where people live, love, and work. This is from WHO 1986. Um, but it's proven again in 2022 because people say, so where I am, I need to change and I need support here. Third, um, what has to come in parallel, um, people demanded to have uh, climate neutrality has to be the new normal. So this was their um, recommendation. So the sustainable choice must be the easy choice. We all know that the real prices for destruction of natural resources don't are on the price tag. We all pay it on, on other ways. 
So we need really to change the rules of the game and how pro we produce food and goods for our daily livings uh, with e.g. taxes on resources. And um, we also, I would really support the uh, great turn of Earth for All, who pointed out that the disadvantages get a fair share of the profits that con companies make with the common goods, the water, the land, the biodiversity, the atmosphere, the education, and our data. Otherwise, polarization in our countries will increase and our countries will become ungovernable. Is it right? Ungovernable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, horrible. So. We, this both has to go together. If people feel disadvantages, they will not engage for our common goal. Last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention, for all people who believed in Bund for Future, the politics as well, and realized and supported, and for the support of the city of Bonn. And if you are have a look uh, this is our website um there are voices about what we should it's in german so thanks also to um miss Moshkovsky for sharing this presentation with us i think this is a truly uh insightful and inspiring example um showing us how to provide people with agency uh, to engage in uh, in a process um, for, for climate action at local level and uh, we will later on before moving to the discussion also hear from a representative from the city of Bonn who, who joined um, about the uh, follow-up of this initiative but first uh, I would like to invite our um, second presenter from the learning city of Carretaro uh, Ms. Carla Lucia Venegas from Miselio Urbano, and uh, she will share her city's initiative on how climate assemblies can help greening communities, supporting popular movements for sustainability in the community of uh, Felipe Carrillo Puerto. And uh, please note that the presentation will be in Spanish language, so uh, our Spanish interpreter will provide language interpretation into English. And for this, I would like to ask everyone who wants to um, listen to the presentation in English to move from uh, the original audio uh, to the Spanish channel. So in the Spanish channel, you will have the English interpretation uh, for this presentation. And please, once um, Carla's presentation is finished, you will have to move back to uh, where you were before and all Spanish speaking um, followers, attendees in our webinar uh, will be able to follow the presentation of Carla in the original audio channel. So with that, I give over the floor to you, Carla. You have eight minutes and we look forward to hear what is happening. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muchas gracias. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Como bien mencionan, eh, As you've mentioned, yo me Urbano, I'm located in uh, represent Miseli Urbano. It is a community of learning composed by a multidisciplinary team looking for retreating the traditions as well as the scientific knowledge in Pro of Nature. Since the year 2019, we actively participate in Carrillo Puerto Querétaro in what it is known the House of Social Linking Alternative Space in the seminary about how the citizen assemblies for climate may contribute so that the communities may be more ecological. I would like to share a little bit of the work that we have been doing in this space, very namely in um, Amili, Happy Land and Florida. I would like to give the context about what Carrillo Puerto is and where it is located on. Please move to the next slide. Felipe Carrillo Puerto is located in the north part in the subcharged area of the sub basin of Querétaro that uh, goes to the Pacific Ocean. It is located under the three rivers of the Arenal River that goes from north to the south in the municipality of Querétaro. This water basin or watershed and the uh, metropolitan area of Querétaro is in the Altiplan of Querétaro. This location located a strategic location to verti soils that are fertile soils, wood, as well as wild fruits and a load of wells and rivers. Carrillo Puerto initially was a rural space full of uh, party and tradition dedicated to the land and to animals. 
by like a, like a deer, it was devoured by the industry, giving as a result an industrial Carrillo Puerto with a lot of scarcity to what it was before. In this uh, rural transition into an industrial change with the lack of regulation of technology for both the cleaning of municipal water, uh, sewage water, the rivers were totally polluted. And because of that, starting an environmental degradation, losing animals and lands, soils, and so the means of living of the inhabitants, making the people to migrate somewhere else. The coverage of, of those lands that are now turned into industrial depots and highly urbanized areas contributes to the creation of this phenomenon known as heat island, losing the climatic regulation of this area, as well as the lack of a good property. So which system generating those into flood, mixing water rain in the dry areas with uh, a sewage water that results into a lot of sewage problems and a huge blocks with totally polluted waters affecting the health of all the people either people living in this area or not. As a reply, the, the people strengthens the organizations in community neighborhoods to call the community who denies to lose their own identity, thus originating different popular movements to make a press on local authorities and governmental leaders so that they take a concrete actions towards their sustainability and, the, and a better life. It hasn't been easy. There are fights for this chatarrera, these open dumps of old irons to open air, those polluting the air inside the inhabitant area. This was a uh, fight of 30 years. It's been a 30 year fight where this dump or chatarrera was regulated and this space was then transformed into a park thanks to management and popular organization where participating all neighbors, mothers, young people, child collectives, thus the, also using the intervention of uh, uh, political will authorities in what is now the uh, Libera Park. Nowadays, our movement looks for the acknowledgement of Amelie, Happy Land, and Florida as a community garden by part of the authorities of the City Hall of Querétaro. This is space that initiates as part of the parcels, then turns into, into a nothing. And because of these abandonments and for not having the proper regulations, it just becomes an illegal dump area where a particular companies of garbage collection were throwing their, their trash in this area. Even though in the town, part of the traditions included sport, for example, soccer as well as kites, this traditional era of Carrillo Puerto doesn't have the proper space for recreation or for appreciation of nature. Under this need, an initiative that is born so that children may have a good place to enjoy the life, then we have the community with the, uh, with, uh, the um, with our Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro, with Social Lincoln, and by Miseli Urbano, as well as the UNESCO Learning Cities of Querétaro, and what is acknowledged today as the co uh, Committee of Protection admittedly by turning this dump area into an area of joy where they are sharing games, activities, and training programs for environmental promoters. By adding dub 100 activity, 27 towing trucks, a lot of them um, uh, management by the University of Querétaro by, by forestation, reforestations, and having the proper facilities of a sewage system that was built by the university for catching the rain water, as well with a good design of the uh, 
over the area and construction of different materials by, that were recycled, as well as a urban farm, a community medicinal park with natural, with natural facilities for the joy of everybody. As we've noticed, the citizen communities have the potential to create this social link and by sharing experience and building up the no to concrete actions that will strengthen up the environmental commitment of everybody involved. It can be a space for sharing knowledge and to analyze information about the effects, change, and interest. Those are different processes where the take of decision is collective, where there's an ecology that is reflected in the means of communication inside this collective. This ecology goes from the micro to macro, and it gives a sense of identity to the territory by making the society aware of its connection to the territory and by manifesting its ecological emergency. The Citizen Assembly for Climate may contribute in a very important way to make communities to be more ecological in different ways, from awareness and education. Those assemblies may help to increase the awareness about environmental issues at a local and global way. Those given a platforms to teach community about uh, the practices and benefits, also generating ideas. Assemblies allows for citizens to propose ideas and specific solutions so that they can talk uh, local environmental issues. This may include initiatives to decrease the waste, promote renewable energies, and improve the public transportation, or as in this case, to generate those uh, common points to talk about nature. Pressure and advocacy. The assemblies may generate pressure on local authorities and governmental leaders so that they take the proper actions to sustainability and to the decrease of climatic change. Communitary actions, those by fostering the people to be organized and work together in local environmental activities, for example, the park cleaning and campaigns of recycling. The foster of political uh, uh, situations that may influence in the creation of more sustainable pol policies, the empowerment of community by involving citizens in the take decision procedures by strengthening the sense of commitment and property over the environmental issues, those taken change of behaviors that are more sustainable. Altogether, the assemblies for uh, climate might be powerful catalyzers to transform communities to a more ecological practices at the time that they are empowering citizens in order to participate more actively in the protection of environment. In this concern, we want to invite you to be part of this uh, movement and thus collaborating to protect and rescue and retrieve this garden to the, in the benefit of Carrillo Puerto Querétaro, where you can sign our petition by the QR code by just leaving you a brief reminder that both authorities, local and international authorities, can be interlinked to society that gives life to this movement for a, a common benefit. In such important issues, for example, the re, uh, retrieving of green spaces to decrease the mitigation that the cities have on nature by allowing to have a closer future that might be sustainable and to dignify life by building up communities that are green, inclusive, and resilient urban communities. The, the more spaces that we have that will be green and happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla, um, for your presentation. I will now remind everyone um, who followed the original in, in Spanish to move back to the Spanish channel and for all participants who follow uh, the webinar in English to come back to the original channel. Um, so uh, we we are very happy, I think, to, to learn more about this uh, Caretaros project. And um, uh, so after these excellent presentations now, um, and before we move to the discussion part, we will have a few minutes only for the discussion, but I would like to invite Mr. Rafael Kahoot uh, to take the floor. He's the head of the section on citizen engagement in the city of Bonn, and he was accompanying the Bonn for Future uh, process or the follow-up. 
Um, and uh, so he will very briefly share with us some updates on the sustainability of the initiative in Bonn. So please, Mr. Karutz, uh, the floor is yours. You, you can take two to three minutes uh, to present. Yeah, many thanks. I hope I, you can all hear me well. Um, and yeah, thank you for giving me the chance to talk very briefly about the follow up, what we do with the uh, all the results that came up from the Bond for Future process. You've all learned about Bond for Future in the um, video uh, that Giza Maszkowski uh, presented. And um, I cannot talk much about that process because I was not involved there, but now I can talk about what we do with uh, the results. And the city of Bonn um, did take up um, the suggestions and the results in general of the Bonn for Future process in their very, I would say, ambitious climate neutrality plan that Bonn um, follows, uh, climate neutrality until 2035. And um, what we are currently working on is, I mean, obviously climate neutrality cannot be done by the municipality alone. Um, we have around 60% of bonds emissions that are that lie beyond uh, the direct influence of the city administration. So the question remains, um, how can we um, really engage the participants of Bond for Future and all residents of Bonn um, in this huge task of climate neutrality, but also urban resilience. And this needs a major urban transformation, socio-ecological transformation. And um, one of our major um, approaches there is, I would say, a decentralization. So we want to go more into the neighborhoods and do a bit less of the participatory formats on the entire city scale. And um, this is what we call climate neighborhoods. Um, we start with four climate neighborhoods um, in which the, the, the urban activities concentrate for climate neutrality, for climate resilience. And each of those neighborhoods, for example, will have like a co-production center. Um, this is how I translated it into English. Um, I don't know if this is a proper term. Um, and in this co-production um, center, people come together and co-create basically their their approaches to a livable, sustainable bond or, or their personal neighborhood. And what we think is that it's much more concrete when you go like in this decentral, um, uh, like in, into, the, into the neighborhoods and more close to where people actually live, where they spend their time um, and less abstract than on a city scale. And so this is a major endeavor that we're currently following. Um, it's still under um, development, I would say. We want to start this year and we are still also in political um, um, uh, discussions about it, how exactly this can form. But I just invite everybody to, to follow um, up on this um, idea. Um, this is a long-term plan. We want to do this until 2035, um, those climate neighborhoods. And um, I would be really keen also now in the discussion to hear if other cities do the same or if there is um, interest in exchange also in, in terms of best practice, maybe. We are very eager to learn also from your experience. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, um, uh, Rafael Karutz, uh, for making time in your busy agenda today to um, provide this input, which I find extremely relevant because it shows us how um, such participatory formats and uh, can be translated into longer term uh, impact and uh, can be continued to ensure that the collective wisdom that is uh, brought together um, through climate assemblies or similar formats can really have a lasting impact. Um, I saw that we had some uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, some of them have already been answered. Um, if there are some more questions, I can't um, I can't see in the in the chat. Um, we have uh, I would have one question and I think uh, we won't have much more time uh, today. Uh, but I would have one question maybe for um, either um, either of you. Um, we have a lot of uh, learning city members in the webinar today, focal points, uh, possibly mayors. And uh, is there one suggestion that you could give on how to start this process if someone is inspired today uh, to um, 
engage in such process of, of, of citizen participation for climate action, what would you recommend to as a first step to take? Um, I don't know, uh, Raphael, if you want to make a suggestion on that or, or also Bjorn um, very briefly. I can briefly start. Um, in Bonn, it was clearly um, the citizen um, engagement that started it. So there were very active um, initiatives that pushed for um, climate neutrality in Bonn and, and the, um, the politics and administration took up that initiative and, um, and created that also now climate neutrality plan out of it. But the initial um, push came definitely from the citizens, which is remarkable, I think, and very important. Definitely. I don't know, Bjorn, do you want to? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, the fir first question one should ask oneself is, do you really want to make a climate assembly? Because mm -hmm. there are other methods, and are you ready to integrate it properly in a decision-making process? Because if you're not, don't do it. I mean, the second advice is to, to contact us uh, as NOCA in NOCA, because I mean, this is funded by the European Climate Foundation. So me and my colleagues, we, we are there to give free advice. Uh, and, and one of the first questions we will ask is, do you really want to make a climate assembly? So, um, and quickly about um, exchange of knowledge. Uh, we have some ex expect, uh, experiences in Denmark with uh, green neighborhood communities, which are a little bit more decentral than what you're mentioning, Raphael, but also think your your um, uh, your comment here is interesting because I mean these are processes at two sides of an engagement scale. One, the climate assemblies on the mini public method is designed to open up power rooms and decision making processes for representative inclusion. So it's one way of uh, addressing uh, the task. The other one is where you empower uh, local communities to act uh, themselves, which is, for example, the green neighborhood communities I've, I've been talking about. You're very welcome to get in touch. Thank you so much both. Uh, and I think with this, unfortunately, today we have a very packed agenda and um, uh, we will have to to end uh, our webinar now. Uh, and so I have to say from from my side, I very much enjoyed the contributions that were made today. I found them very inspiring and insightful, and I hope that they will encourage um, many cities uh, in today's webinar to uh, consider this possibility uh, of a climate assembly or a similar format. And um, for those who are already in a process uh, like that, I hope they could gain some fresh idea on how to continue and make this process sustainable. So uh, for today, I would like to thank all the speakers and participants for joining us. And of course, the UL team, uh, in particular, also Paolo and, and Katie, who have been uh, supporting very much in the background to make this webinar possible. And I'm looking forward to our next session, which will take place on Wednesday, 15th of May, at the same time as today. And then we will explore the topic of building capacities for an eco-friendly future, the importance of green skills. And with that, I wish all of you a nice uh, end of your rest of your day and evening ahead. And thank you very much. <laughs>